we're speaking about the life of the Arizal, right? The life and the major lessons of the Arizal. So tonight is uh, the Arizal's Yurtzeit. It's a day of his passing. And I could tell you here in Sfat, I mean, there's there's no tourism, basically. I mean, very little. But whatever tourism did come, it came for the Arizal. And there are cars trying to get through, even the police is not allowing it. But there's definitely an energy that uh, that is felt, you know, due to this tzaddik, this incredible, incredible tzaddik called Rabbi Yitzchak Luria Ashkenazi, who lived over 500 years ago. And, uh, and we're going to speak a little bit about his life, his legacy, and some of his main teachings. So who was Rabbi Yitzchak Luria Ashkenazi, right? So from his mother's side, he was uh, Sephardic. It, and from his mother's side, he was uh, of German descent, Ashkenaz, like classic Ashkenaz. So we could say it was like a mixed marriage. You know, it was Sephardic Ashkenaz and something beautiful came out. Right, this mixture of harmony. So right there and then, at the beginning of his life, right, even as he was conceived, it was like an anomaly to have, you know, an Ashkenazic uh, male want to marry a uh, a Sephardic female woman, and they got together, right? And she was actually uh, from Egypt. That was that was where she was from, and her brother was a successful businessman. That. Uh, and the family was a successful, uh, wealthy, influ influential family. And so uh, Rabbi Yitzhak Luria's father passed away when he was very young. And he was uh, essentially brought up by his uncle, right? And from Yushalayim, where he was born in the old city, the actual old city within the walls of Jerusalem, that was his, his actual birthplace. And you could go visit it next time that you're in Jerusalem. As you're walking down towards the Cardo, that says actually the Orachaim HaKadosh, his shul, and also the birthplace of the Arizal. So it's interesting that the Orachaim shul, right, later on, he had it in the birthplace of the Arizal. And you could go to the actual room where he was born in. And it's a very, it's a very powerful ex experience at, at, for me, you know, coming from Tzfat and visiting there. It like brings a lot of connections, which we're going to get more into. We're going to speak about more. But he grew up in, in Yerushalayim, but he grew up most of his, most of his life was in Egypt. That's, you know, and he was, he was married at a young age to his cousin. So his uncle became his father-in-law, right? And uh, and he supported the young couple. And the Arizal was a prodigy from a young age of exceptional levels where he would learn something and he would know it, right? He would consume Torah, right? And he could consume books and the Talmud and he would just and uh, the story has it that when he was in Egypt one day, uh, learning in the uh, base medrash in the stu uh, study hall, he uh, he sees someone who's learning a a particular book, and he's wondering like, what is that book? You know, he hasn't seen that book before. He's he's you know he knows all the books, right? And he hasn't seen that book, so he goes up to that person, and he asks him, "What are you learning?" And uh, and that individual said, it's the Zohar, right? It's the book, it's the esoteric book of Kabbalah, right? Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the classic book of the Zohar. And he's heard of it, but he's never seen it before. And he says, may I, right? And he, they sit down and they learn, and the Arizal is automatically consumed by this learning because his soul was searching and yearning for the depth, the deepest depth possible. 
you know, for a human person to achieve in essence. And he was in search and an ex exploration of it, like a deep exploration of it. And, uh, and so anyway, so he started learning the Zohar. He started learning these books and he became so proficient, right? In the learning of the Zohar, right? The depth of the Zohar that he became like, he had almost systems in his head, memorizing and thinking and, and, and analyzing. And then he heard about the teachings of the Ramak, right? Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, who was the most influential Kabbalist of the time. The Ramak wrote uh, a number of books, including the book called Pardes Rimonim, right? The Orchard of, uh, the, the, of Pomegranates. And a pirush and an explanation on the Zohar called Or, or Yakar, the uh, the Arizal gets uh, his his hands on these books, and he learns everything there is to learn that the Ramak teaches. Right, so the Ramak is centered and is based in Tzfat, and the Arizal is in Egypt, and he's reaching higher and higher levels of spiritual connection, right? To the point that he he has a Gilui Eliyahu. He has a revelation of, of Elijah, right? That Elijah starts to teach him because basically when we do everything that we could do, then, and we say to God, we say to Hashem, I, I'm, I'm searching for more. Then Hashem is like, I'm going to send you what you need to know because you sincerely want to know. And that's the, that's the case. Whenever we really want to know something, Hashem sends the teacher. Hashem sends the teacher. It's, it's, it's always the case. Like as long as we really want to know. Because, we, because, if, because if a person is like, no, I don't really want it. So then what's the point of, because it's all developing yeah. the ratzon, developing our inner will. And developing the inner will is really the strongest because that's where learning really happens. It happens from an intrinsic place. There's external motivation and intrinsic motivation. When a person is intrinsically motivated to learn, to study, to connect, then they're connected to the panemius. They're connected to the inner world, right? Whereas if a person doesn't want to connect, then they're connected to the external. And that that basically is a, is a is a huge distinction between the inner Torah and which is called Panimisa Torah, the inner aspects of Torah and the outer, because the outer doesn't necessarily require one to have a deep yearning for the depths, right of of God, right? It does puts you, put you in the study of Torah, right? But the externality of the analytical and the, the you know and the back and forth which is connecting to god really on the deepest um, but it could be uh relegated to the external whereas the internal is when a person really wants to delve into what these arguments and what the depth of the pasuk is talking about what is the what is this interpretation because the soul is really connected to something which is not non-physical, it's connected to the to the to the non-physical, godly reality. Our bodies are connected to this world, so we need both parts of Torah. But the Arizal went deeper and deeper, and as he went deeper, the the deepest that he could go, he has a revelation of Eliyahu and Navi. So Eliyahu and Navi teaches him for. A number of years it's not clear how many years but he gets guidance like he's like his mentor is 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 elijah you know so that's like that's pretty good so that at a certain point eliyahu navi tells him you need to go up to Sfat to teach one student and and he says, okay. So he packs his bags, takes his family. And his, his custom was that he spent the entire week by the Nile River. 
in learning and in solitude and in meditation and prayer, right? And learning the these depths of depths, right? And then from there on Shabbat, he would go back home to his family, right? And so the family now leaves and they go up to, to the north of Israel, right? To Tzfat. And at, in Tzfat, there's like an absolute renaissance that is going on. It's called the Golden Age of Tzfat, where the first printing press was brought to. And there were, there were the greats, the likes of Rabbi Yosef Karo, right? Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, right? Uh, the Al Shech Hakadosh, Rabbi Yaakov Beirav, right? The um, Rabbi Chaim Vital, uh, Rabbi Moshe Galianti, and and the list goes like on and on and on and on, to the point that, you know, this was the place of scholarship, and here comes a man, an unknown of thirty six years old. That's what he was. Nobody heard about him. Nobody knew who he was. And he walks onto this, like, you could say scene, right? Of like, a very holy scene, right? <laughs> of like the great, of like the greatest of the greats that were here. And, you know, and he does his, does his thing. But in a, 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 a couple of weeks, it's not clear exactly when, the Ramak passes away, Rabbi Moshe Cordovero. So the Arizal probably got to see the Ramak. Who knows if they met, right? And it seems like they like they there was a connection, right? There was there was definitely a connection because uh before the Ramak passed, his students asked him, who's going to take over your uh leadership? Right? So the Ramak said, there's, there's going to be a man that is going to see a fire, right, coming above my coffin. And that person is going to be, right, the, uh, the successor. So the Ramak passes on the 23rd day of, uh, of Tammuz. And his students be, uh, take him for burial down in the cemetery, right? In Sfat. And the Ari is a part of the procession. And the Ari basically expresses, wow, do you, do you see this light? Right? Do you guys see this? Right? This, this man was such a holy man, right? This, you know, there was such a revelation. And they all look at the Ari and and they're like, okay, we thought that you were a regular, you know, a regular person, right? A guy just came off the street. And, and so they tell him, like, we know who you are, basically. So the Ari starts teaching, right, this small group. And yet the Ari knows that his main student has not yet come to him. And his main student was Rabbi Chaim Vital, was going to be. So Rabbi Chaim Vital was a very uh, smart uh, and sophisticated Torah scholar that was also involved in, in business and he was involved with, he, he was, and he was way older than the Arizal, like you, it seems like he was, you know, he was probably in his 70s. Arizal was 36, right? And, and the Arizal tells him, like, like drops notes, he says, basically, you should come learn by me, you know, that he was kind of saying to him. And Rabbi Chaim Vital is like, why? You know, my, my Rebbe is, is Rabbi Shlomo Alkabetz, right? My Rebbe is uh, the Alshech. My Rebbe is Rabbi Yosef Karo. What do you have? To, the, my Rebbe is the Ramak. What do you have to offer? Kind of a thing. And the Arizal, the Arizal, like, kind of like persuades him and tells him. And then it gets to a point that the, uh, the Arizal, as, as he's explaining a certain portion in the Zohar, what he explains becomes 
completely visualized and seen by uh, by Rabbi Chaim Vital. And so Rabbi Chaim Vital is like, this person is not, he's not a regular person. And he starts listening to him and he was, is astounded by the depth of novelty that is coming out of his mouth. And to the point that Rabbi Chaim Vital didn't understand what the Ariza was saying. The Ariza was going so fast like beyond his comprehension. In other words, until the Arizal got his attention, took time. But once he got his attention, Rabbi Chaim Vital could not follow the depth of the Arizal. And the Arizal told him that I'm here in Sfat to teach you. And in fact, I'm in this world to teach you. That's what he's right? says, why? Because your soul, and he started to teach him where his soul really came from. He went back into his reincarnations and he says that you're this reincarnation of of Chizkiyahu uh, HaMelech, of King Hezekiah, who's supposed to be Mashiach. You know, and that soul goes all the way back to, to Adam. And Basically, you're this conduit, right? The Arizal, who's the teacher, is saying to Rabbi Chaim Vital, I'm in this world to basically teach you. And they develop, right, the deepest type of, of a relationship possible where, I mean, they were, they were basically with one another, like almost all the time, right? That's That's basically what was, what was going on. And um, so at first, Rabbi Chaim Vital didn't understand the depth of the Arizal until the Arizal says, come with me, we're going on a field trip. And he takes them to the Kinneret. And in the Kinneret, he takes them on a boat and they go to a certain area. They're rowing. They get to a certain area. And the Arizal says, take, take your cup and I want you to take the cup and dip it in the water below you. He does as his teacher says. And he has this water. And he makes a blessing over it. And he drinks. And he says, as soon as he drinks, he has this opening of the mind. That he has never had before. And the Arizal said that this exact place over here is where the well of Miriam is at. Because we know that the well of Miriam was in the merit of Miriam, Hanaviah, Miriam the, the prophetess, that the Jewish people were traveling with in the desert for 40 years. And as they entered Eretz Yisrael, they entered the Holy Land. So the, the well went into the Kinneret. And so the, the well is still there and there are uh, opinions of where that is, right? There's a certain, it says this, there's a certain strip in the water. If you look at a certain angle, then there's a certain, uh, you, you could see a certain shadow of that. But, uh, but the Arizal knew exactly where it was because he didn't, and he didn't know, he didn't have to have any GPS or anything of that sort. And uh, and after drinking that water, Rabbi Chaim Vital's mind was opened up to the depth of what his master was teaching him. And they literally became in, inseparable, right? To the point that in two years that the Ariza was here in the city of Tzfat, just two years from the year 1968, until 19, I'm sorry, 1568, until 1570, right? For two years, the Arizal taught Rabbi Hamita and the other students, right? The depths of depths of, of Kabbalah, which was then uh, transcribed 
by Rabbi Chaim Vital in the book called the Eitz Chaim, the Tree of Life. And there are approximately 10 to 15 volumes, depending on, you know, how you, how it's broken up of, right, of, they're pretty thick, each one of them. And though that's a composite of the teachings that was done in just two years, right? And within these two years, much of the teachings was not done in like one spot, like in a classroom setting, right? They went to different places, right? The Arizal used to go, he says, come, we're, we're, we're going to learn like field trip, like we're going here. And they used to learn in a certain location because a certain location was more conducive to, to the learning and the depth of it. And who was buried there was conducive to the to to right the tzaddik that was there because the Ariza would go and he would and he would go to certain places and he would say, "Oh, this is where this tzaddik is buried," because he used to see their nefesh, right, their level of soul. So you would see that and you would say, "This is this Tana, this Amora, this you know this great tzaddik from this generation," and he named them, and he had his students. Uh, mark these graves, these areas, and that's how we know basically where these great uh, Tanaim, these great Sadiqim are buried from the Arizal. So that's part of what he did in two years, which which is phenomenal. But besides revealing all the depths that he did, just by revealing these Sadiqim where they're at does such incredible uh, good for the world. Right, because people know where these tzaddikim are. It says, "What? Why is Moshe's grave not known?" Right, nobody knows where Moshe is at. It says, "If we would go to Moshe's grave and pray there, then then God would have to answer. Like God, right? It would be like too strong. So Moshe's grave is is hidden. So so by going to the graves of tzaddikim, we are able to." Right, not God forbid, pray to them, but we're able to utilize their merit in heaven, and we're basically, you know, we're in the proximity. So just having that is such a big deal. But what was interesting is that he went from place to place, and one of the most important places that he loved to go to with his students is currently exactly the location of the northern command of the IDF. In Sfat. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not kidding you. It right, it's called Ein Avnit. Like we know that exact area in um in the bar above by the Beria forest, and it overlooked uh the, the Jordan uh ridge, the valley, right? You could see the the Golan Heights on the other side. Gorgeous view, like the most incredible, incredible view. And used to sit there. In that place, which was near Abaye and Rava, who were two of the greatest um, commentators, right, or called Amoraim in the Talmud, he used to sit there and he used to uh, clarify and teach these depths of uh, of learning, right, in, the, in that location. So in two years, the Arizal basically revolutionizes the whole way that Kabbalah is understood the way Kabbalah is taught and bringing it a notch forward right into what we could say the world right because up until then there was a certain disconnect between the inner parts of Torah and the and the inner and the external which means like the external aspects of reality were not as connected to their inner core, right, of, of what they are. So this revelation is a revelation that really revolutionized the, the whole, not just learning of inner, of Torah, of the inner Torah, but revolutionized the system that this light could be brought down into our world, right, into the world of basically every person right not just yet because it's such deep right such deep learning but everything has to come from its 
from its true source, like from where it comes from. And then it becomes more and more accessible, which was later done in the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov, where these, where these teachings of the inner light were then taken to be accessed on a, on a, a on an inner internal level, right? Where God is not just up there in the, in the, in the intellect, but God is in the heart. God is, is within our day to day. And so that's what the Arizal really did in these two years. And essentially he was in this world to bring this light of, of Hashem, of seeing the, the interconnection of everything within existence, which only now, like even physics and, you know, the, in the latest findings, they're, they're calling it the God particle, right? That the pho photon, right, is like on its, right? As if we break down the atom, we break down the quarks, we go to the, to the particle, right? What is that particle? That's the godly particle that, that really creates everything, right? And that everything in, everything in existence is not the material and physical that we see, but it's God that's within everything in existence. That reality isn't what we can feel and see and, right, and touch. But reality is way vaster than what we could what we can imagine and the arizal did this in two years and rabbi Chaim vital said that had he lived for another five years he would have brought half of the world to do tshuva that half of the world would have been elevated right what does that mean half of the world so he didn't have social media he didn't have twitter how could he bring half of the world to become elevated? So it says that how the half of the world to become elevated means that through his work, right? Rabbi Chaim Vital said that through this work of like concentrated connection to this learning and to Hashem, right? On this amplified frequency that was being studied over here, in this time, right, that that amplified frequency would have lifted up the whole, right, half of the world, right, within five years. That's what Rabbi Chaim Vital said. And had he lived for another 10 years, he would have brought up the entire world to a readiness for Geula, for Mashiach. That's, that's what Rabbi Chaim Vital said. And he also said that he was Mashiach ben Yosef, that he was the soul of Mashiach ben Yosef, that there's, 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 for redemption is God's revelation within this world, right, in, in a revealed way. So for that to happen, there needs to be a preparation for that. What's the preparation? Preparation is Mashiach ben Yosef. He prepares the world. Just like Yosef prepared Egypt, right? He was able to be within this physical world and reveal God within the physicality. And so that's a preparation for Mashiach ben David, who's able then to uh, draw Hashem within the physicality, right? And for, and, and for it to be unified. So the story is that the Arizal, um, there's there's a number of stories actually about this. It says that one is Rabbi Hamital asked his master to teach him a certain secret. He said, "Please don't ask me to, to to teach you that." So so he like begged him, and he taught him that secret. And he said, "You should know because I taught you that secret. Now, you know I you know like." Whatever, something is going to be, right? It's going to happen. And uh, Rabbi Chaim Vital is like, well, what do you mean? So he's like, you know, I couldn't turn you down. I had to teach you. And then, the, and then the story has it that he went with his master to 
the grave of Shmaya and Naphtalion, who are buried, who were the two leaders of Israel, uh, uh, basically before Hillel and Shammai, in the time of the end of the Second Temple. So they're buried uh, in Gush Chalav, not far from here. And he went, he went there. And after that, he said, you know, you should know that uh, it's kind of been decided that, uh, you know, I'm said I'm going to be taken. And, and there was still some time over there. And apparently there was a machlokas. There was an argument that broke out between um, the students, a few of the students, that erupted, unfortunately, into, into an argument. And the Arizal asked, and he said, in the merit of peace, right, we can really, uh, we can almost save things. And that, that persisted, right? It persisted. And we should know that the whole premise of actually learning with the Arizal was which is the whole premise of really before learning Torah and praying each and every day, we say so to just get in, you have to have this. So for this to be going on was pretty serious. And he said, please, like, please stop. And he persisted. And the Arizal basically said it's uh it's too late. And there was a um sort of an epidemic back in back in the day that they had, you know, frequent such epidemics and things were not easy for them at all, right? Um in in spot and in general, um, where there were marauders and there was different, you know, different difficulties that they had. And the Arizal basically passed on the fifth day of of today at the age of 38, right? And with that ended effectively the golden age of Tzfat. Right, it was a time that these, uh, all of these luminaries that were living over here, were, you know, they they were distraught. Right, that this that, you know that that this happened was was just something that was, almost like why, because they were so close they felt, to the geula right to to redemption basically that was their agenda. Their agenda was to create a, a utopic sort of society, the Haftarecha Kamocha society of generating this frequency of love and connection to God, of light that was going to permeate all over the world. They were going to create this ring, this circle of life, and it was happening. And then it stopped. So the, mo the, the person that was the most distraught and most broken was obviously Rabbi Chaim Vital. He felt like he maybe caused this. And he realized like this was all like, uh, you know, it's too much. And Rabbi Chaim Vital, I mean, apparently it sounds like he goes into a serious, um, obviously you can't, it, depression, but it's, but it's a serious type of a, a low that he really feels like, like, you know, it's a missed opportunity, especially since the Arizal told him who his reincarnations were. And basically, right? And he had a chance to do so much in this lifetime that he could have been, he could have been the soul of, of Mashiach, basically. He had that possibility. He was the soul of, of, of Hizkiyahu Amelech. He, he could have been that. Or him and juxtaposed with ours, but but it was a missed opportunity, and and so Rabbi Chaim Vital basically leaves. He needs to leave Tzfat, and he leaves Tzfat. Where does he go to? He goes to uh, Yerushalayim, 
And in Yerushalayim, he's recognized by the uh, by the Turkish uh, sultan that was that was there, or the ruler that was there. And uh, and his name was Abu Saif. And that man uh, wanted to wanted to meet with with uh, with Rabbi Chaim Vital. And Rabbi Chaim Vital refuses this meeting. And what he does is he uses holy names called Shemos Hakodesh, holy names, to transport himself, teleport himself to Syria. Right? There are certain names that were used by the Baal Shem Tov, right? By Tzadikim to be able to teleport. Right? And so he used these names and, and he went to Syria. And so he has a dream. He gets a dream. And who's and who's in his dream? The Arizal, his, his, his master comes to him in the dream. And he said to him, You missed the opportunity. And he said, What do you what do you mean? What do you mean I missed the opportunity? We missed the opportunity. You're not here. He said, You missed the opportunity. That Abu Saif was a reincarnation. Of Sancheirev, and in fact, it's the same Gematria. Abu, Sa and he tells him like that. And Sancheirev was the, and you're the soul of Chizkiyahu Amelech, right? And Chizkiyahu Amelech took basically, what he did was he uh, stopped the water supply. One of the things that he did, he 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 took he, he uh, redirected the water supply of the Gihon River in Yerushalayim for it not to go out to the uh, outside of the old city, basically, that was going to serve the troops of Sancheriv, of the Assyrian kingdom, that came to basically take over Jerusalem, right? Just like they did with the 10 tribes. So they took already the 10, ten tribes and they, they, they um, cast them away. And now they came to do the same for, for Yerushalayim. And so Chizkiyahu uh, Amelech is like, well, let me do something over here. We have no chance. Like, what's going on? They're going to, right? It was the superpower of the world. And the, the only thing that Yushalayim really had, it had walls. I mean, they had a couple of, you know, there were some troops, but they were surrounded. And so he did what he could in, in his estimation. But it says, Yeshaya Hanavi, Isaiah, says to uh, Chizkiyahu, he's like, why'd you do that? He's like, well, I tried to do what I had to do. He's like, the whole thing is miraculous. God is going to save us regardless of what you're going to do. Yes, you know, prepare, but like, but like, what, like, why would you, why, why would you do that? And so there's a lot of like deep, like secrets with this, with this water, and this water supply and the whole idea of like, why did he really hold it back? So it says that he, he, he held it, he held back the water and that was a sign of a certain lack of trust. So the Arizal says that you're a reincarnation of Chizkiyahu Melech and that Abu Saif is a reincarnation of Sancher. If you could have actually come together and there would have been what we call like a, a, a sweetening or a fixing of these two of these two worlds, basically of Jacob and Esau, but of Gogu Magog, because it says that God wanted to make Chizkiyahu Melech Mashiach and Sancheirev Gogu, Gogu Magog, and he and he wanted to like wanted to get it over with. So because you did that, you missed another opportunity. So Rabbi Chaim Vital is like, like now what? So he has with him the volumes of the Eitz Chaim. And so while he was in Tzfat after the passing of the Arizal, his students are very curious of what he's going to do with his manuscripts, right? Because, because okay, this has happened, but we want the manuscripts. We want to perpetuate what we've had. So they're trying to they're trying to get it from him, and he's like, "Nope, I'm not giving it to anyone. Uh, like this is mine." 
So this story, Rabbi Moshe Galiante, who was a very well, wealthy uh, student of his, said, listen, I'll pay for your daughter's wedding if I could, if I could like have a look at this for like a couple of hours. So it was hard to turn that one down. I'm sure it's not like this, you know, lavish, like huge, you know, expensive wedding that, you know, probably, but whatever it was, he gets a couple of hours and he hires all of these scribes to come in. So he has like a book or two and these scribes come in and they took it and they copy it and he gives back the book to Rabbi Chaim Vital. And right. And so this happens a couple of times, similar stories, but there's a whole number of books that Rabbi, Rabbi Chaim Vital has with him. That's his most precious possession is the Arizal's books. So now he's in Syria and, and he basically spends the rest of his life there. He spends the rest of his life there, right? We'll talk about that why, why he went to Syria because and why the Arizal came to Tzfat and why, right, there's a, there's a very deep reason for that. But he passes in, uh, in Aleppo, right? There's a, there's a, um, is a tradition that he that he moved his own grave from there to uh Hulon, right? Hulon? Some yeah, I think it's Hulon, yeah. And because Sadiqim, by the way, can do such a thing. It says that about uh the Ben Yishchai, um and, and other Sadiqim, they could do so much in their lifetime, they say, Listen, I wanna I want another plot, I wanna go somewhere else, I wanna so they're able to do that. So uh, so Rabbi, but anyways, but he is buried, he's buried in Aleppo and he takes with him the manuscripts. He says, I want to be buried with them. And he's buried with the manuscripts. So now his students are like, what are we going to do? We, we need these manuscripts. So there's a, um, so two of his students, one of them is called Rabbi Avram Azulai, who wrote the Chesed Le Avram. And another one, uh, I forgot his first name was uh, Ochana. Actually, what his Sefer Torah is in the uh, Abu Hav synagogue. And they say we have to get the, we have to get these manuscripts. So they do something which is called a Taanit ta Chalom where a person like basically they fast and then they, they, they uh, ask Hashem to answer them in their dream. And they put down a question. They write down a question that's underneath their, their pillow or whatever. And they receive an answer. And they ask, can we go and dig up the grave of our master to get these manuscripts? And they, they get the positive, right? They get, they get the, the, the green light. And so both of them prepare for for a while before to, to do this, right? Because it is it's a major undergoing, right? To to do such a thing, especially to to a tzaddik, right? And just to give you like an idea of a story similar to this in the last, we could say 30 years, Rabbi Mordechai Liao, the, the chief rabbi of Israel wanted or d decided that it would be a good idea to bring the the the, the grave of the Chida, the coffin of the Chida, Rabbi Chaim Yosef David Azulai, from, uh, I think he was, he was buried somewhere in Italy where they were going to pave the area. They were going to like, right, they were going to do something with, with where he was buried. So it was going to be really disrespectful. He took it, he, he took that uh, coffin and he was going to have it buried in, in the Harazesim in Israel. So he did that, and when when the when the coffin was brought, literally, Rabbi Mordechai Liao says the story, the coffin literally was shaking, right? And so Rabbi Mordechai Liao said said you know the chida we've done this for your honor, we did this for you you know we did this to respect you, please you know right asking for forgiveness right. 
and the 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 co the coffin like stopped shaking, right? So this is something which was said by by the chief rabbi of Israel. Like I, you know, he said this, right? So it's a major thing. So they prepared and they went in to Aleppo, right, it, to the to the grave, and they got these manuscripts, and that's how we have these teachings of the Arizal, right, called the Eitz Chaim, the Tree of Life. Um, later on, there were there were, there were annotations by Rabbi Chaim Vital's son of Shmuel, and then Tzemach, and and so there's right, and so his teachings were able to be perpetuated, right, uh, despite almost not right, almost like being completely hidden, almost like the the way the Zohar was until it was later on discovered when the world ne you know really needed it, but you know, these students were like, yes, we do need it. Like, we need this light. Like, right? Yeah. Why did he want to be buried in the center if he knew that's what it was? Because he felt uh, so, we could say, dejected, almost like the, like the world isn't ready. That's what he felt. Like, like, look, if the world would have been ready, then the Ariza wouldn't have died. He wouldn't, he, he, he would have lived. Right, so it's a sign that that maybe we're not, you know, uh, we can't, we're not worthy of it, kind of a thing. And his students were like, "Well, that's exactly the point. We have to like, yes, we may not be, but it's like we have to like get get down. We need it. We need to like awaken the these, you know, our dormant selves, right? That unconscious self that doesn't even know that it needs." anything right it, it's it's not even aware that it's lost it's in like in a state of 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 darkness of even knowing that that there is a state of darkness right like it says in the torah it says that in the end of days anochi haster aster panaim at the end of days i will hide and hide double hiding so the question is why does it say i will hide my face from you twice so the um commentaries say I will hide the fact that I'm even hidden. Like that's a like when someone knows that someone is hiding or something is hiding, you're at least, you're at least like at least I know that I'm looking for something. But if you're not you're not even aware that you're supposed to even be looking for it. That's even a sadder place to be in because you think that you you found it and you think that what that light is light but is really darkness. Right, and it's like calling darkness light and light dark. That's what the Navi says, Ishaya. Woe to those who call light dark and darkness light. Like, oh, this celebrity is the next, like, yeah, the, this celebrity, she's the role model that for, like, what? What? Like, whoa, like, right, a president, potential female president. I'm sorry, I have to, like, Bring, bring in a little bit of that I feel is like a type of role models that anyways, I'm going to, but like, it's a, it's a, it's a time of darkness of, of really of, of not, of not even understanding that we're in a state of darkness. Now, how, how d dangerous that is. Right. Of, of like really of how dangerous that is. And that's exactly the point that his students went and they, they grabbed these manuscripts to say, we need to shake up, right, the world, right? We need this, this light. And, and so that brings us really to like the, the deeper agenda of why the Arizal came up to the north and to Tzfat and why Rabbi Chaim Vital even went further than Tzfat, went to Syria, right? So, and he went to Damascus, so in fact, the letters for Damascus lived in Damascus, Aleppo, but Damascus is the letters Damesek, which is Mikdash. It's the same letters as Mikdash. So the Talmud says that when Damascus goes up, Jerusalem goes down. And when Jerusalem goes up, Damascus goes down. There's a pendulum, right? It says when this one goes up, when when Jacob goes up, Esau goes down. 
when Esau goes up, Jacob goes down. It's like, it isn't going to be a, right, until when Mashiach comes, where we're going to have like, you know, a certain merging of, you say, of, of the brothers, right? Where we could say the outer world, the inner world, like those two could coexist. But in the meantime, they're opposing each other. So Rabbi Chaim Vital wanted to go all the way to the north of north, right, to the place Syria, because Syria, King David captured, because Syria, that area is a quasi level of Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel. Like on a certain level, it's a preparation for the three uh, uh, nations, right? The three lands that Israel is going to expand into when Mashiach comes, right? Because Israel currently is the land of the seven nations. Keni, Knizi, Kadmoni, Prizi, Vusi, Chivi, right? There's a, there's the seven nations, but seven nations correspond to the land of Canaan, right? The seven, the seven attributes. But when Mashiach comes, it's going to expand to the land of the three nations, which is the consciousness, which is the meta-consciousness of ourselves, which is Chachma, Bina, and Das, which is going to happen when Mashiach comes, that our higher faculties are going to be expressed, are going to be realized, right? So King David wanted to capture Syria because that is a, a foothold of capturing, right, the these three lands, which corresponds to like pushing the envelope beyond like the norm, like going and right to this higher place of, of true self, right? That's, that's what really Rabbi Chaim Vital was doing. And that's what the Arizal was doing. And that's what, what all of these greats were doing in, in the golden age of Tzfat was here in in the north, because the north progressively became the place where it became the center, because the north represents the susceptible place of all of existence, where if we can put a boundary and neutralize this vacant open area of the north, which represents the vacant also part of ourselves, of our consciousness, then we're able to, to transform that that negativity, right, of exile to really a place of strength and a place of growth, a place of the three nations, of those extra three lands, a place of transformation. But it's really contending with like these darker forces that are found in the north, right? And as we're seeing it now <laughs> in current events, this cannot be like more current events than now, right? But Jeremiah says this, mitzafon, that from the north, tipatach, hefechatov, that from the north, the opposite of good is going to open up, right? And the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar came from the north. That he was called an, a lion, came on the month of the lion to destroy the lion, the Besamikdash is called the lion. So this lion came from the north, right? Destroyed the lion on the month of lion so that the lion, which is Hashem, he's called an Arya, should now come back and build the Arya, build the lion again. That's what the Midrash says. But the northern lion, and then in the time of the second temple, there was the Greek Assyrians that came from the north. And then in the in the second temple, the Romans, 10th legion, came from the north. And bef even before that, the Assyrian king, right, took, took the 10 tribes, the northern tribes. So the north is a place in, in, in physicality, but it's more so, so a place in our mental state of mind right, in our awareness, that place of darkness that needs to be infused with light. And that light of awareness, that light of the, the light of the inner Torah, right, is the light of 
awareness, the light of, of God, light of, of, of Hashem in, in this world, right? In, in, in our minds. And when we're able to do that, then we're able to bring about a sense of transformation of what the North represents. That the North isn't just a susceptible place on the place of negativity, but the North now becomes a place of expansion, which again, this is what King David wanted to do, to capture the Mesek, to take the Mikdash, to transform the Damascus, to transform the negativity, and to make it into, this is now the base of Mikdash. And that's why Syria has certain mitzvot, has certain um, good de um, commandments that have the same law as being in the land of Israel. So for example, Truma and Meiser, if someone gets, so it's rabbinically uh, uh, mandated to give Truma, which is given to the Kohen and to the Levite, in Syria, the same as in the land of Israel, because it was already uplifted to a higher dimension by its level of conquering. So there was a level of conquering that was done by King David, and that was something that that uh, that the Ariza wanted to do in coming up north, and that's what Rabbi Chaim Vital wanted to do in going even further north and to push the envelope, right? But it seems like he got like a little bit like dejected, and, and he got maybe I don't know. God forgive me for that. Maybe a little like taken over by this darkness, right? He was unable to almost do it. Whereas his students came along and they said, you know, we're going to take the mantle now. We're going to take this from here and we're going to go with it. We're going to continue with it, right? And these, these teachings perpetuated and they perpetuate, right? Until now, right? They perpetuate until here, until this day, right? Uh, where where these teachings of the Arizal are basically still like ours, right? And they're within our domain. They're within, and and we have now more of an obligation, right, to learn these teachings than ever, because without these teachings, like we're we're basically lost, right, in that place of darkness, of of confusion, of our northern gate being just open and all like all types of you know confusion and um darkness negativity coming coming through so this awareness of hashem the deep awareness of hashem of connection to him through these learnings of the inner torah right the connection of prayer what is a soul what is kamocha? what is love for the other mean right what is the purpose of our life what happens when we do a mitzvah, when we do a good deed? What happens when, when, when we learn? Like what, like, you know, what is physicality? What does it look like? Like when, when we, when we study the inner, uh, these inner dimensions, then what we do is that we are closing that, that border, which is just saying like, just it's it's vacant and, and just anything could come in and we're not just doing that but we're also transforming the world outside of us which is really our power that's our uh, that's that's our uh because we're we're either like a, a part of the problem or a part of the solution that's basically sometimes we're in the same day we're like it goes back and forth we're like like, you know, 20 times part of the problem, you know, 30 times part of the solution. It's like back and forth, like within the hour, you know, okay, God, okay, let me try. But just even being in the process of knowing that there is a process is at least knowing that you're searching, that you're in the quest. And at least even knowing that you're in the quest, even though you're getting down and dirty, that's part of the solution. The going forward, right? The persistence, the courage to go forward, which is which is what Rabbi Chaim Vital writes in his book, 
right? The one who actually grabbed, um, sorry, Rabbi Avram Azulai, who my grandmother, by the way, is an Azulai, uh, writes that Sfat is the city of Netzach, city of fortitude. So the way to actually get do this work is to is the power of fortitude staying in the game don't put the don't give up don't get you know any minute anything is going to happen like the persistence the staying the staying in the game right for as 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 much as it seems like it's not you know not going forward things are not going you are forward. If you're connected to the light, you're connected to Hashem, you're connected to the intention, then it's going to happen. Right? That it's it, it, it is going to happen. But the question is when that's that's a that's in God's domain. But like when when we are persistent, then we are then drawing forth what is right what is ours right what what hashem wants from us and that's the city of tzfat the city of netzach city of fortitude so it says that we will go out of exile it says um israel yotzim biyadrama the 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 children of israel are going out biyadrama yadrama means an up, outstretched hand or arm and the uh, targum unkolos right translates this in Aramaic, Beresh Gale. We'll go out with an outstretched hand, Beresh Gale. Gale means to revealed, and Resh is literally the head. But they say that Resh stands for Rabbi Yitzchak, and his father's name was Shlomo, and his mother's name was uh, Sarah. So Beresh Gale, with an outstretched we will go out of Golos, out of exile, with the teachings of the Arizal, right? And the teachings of Rabbi Shimon. It says Reish is Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai, right? Rabbi Sral, and his father's name was was uh, was uh, uh, Rabbi Sral uh, Shlomo, right? And and Sarah. And so we will go out in the like through. Through the teachings and the merit of the of of the inner Torah, and just one more point: the connection of the Arizal die, uh, passing on this day, Hey of Av, and the inner aspects of Torah, which is which was revealed basically by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. His passing was on Lag Ba Omer, is very very uh, connected one to the other, because the month of Av is the fifth month, which is the month of Leo, right? And it corresponds to, Kabbalistically, on the spherot, to the sphera of, what's the fifth sphera? Of Hod, which is humility. And the fifth day, right? We know that the week also corresponds to the seventh sphera, right? So the fifth day corresponds to which sphera? Hod. And what is that? Hod Shebehod. Which is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. So this day of is connected to Lagba Omer, which Lagba Omer happened, right, takes place on the sphera of the sphera ta Omer of Hod Shebehod, humility within humility, which is a very, very deep teaching. What humility within humility really means, right? It's being humble to know that I that there is a much greater reality above me. Like I admit and I I hear that there's something greater. That like, and there's a lot there on that. So Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai passed on Hocha on Hocha Behod Lag Omer, and the Arizal passed on Hey of Av fifth day of Av the Hocha Behod of 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 this of of this day. But but it happened when in Av Av is a time of destruction of negativity of darkness once again. The contending with the darkness and the transforming into Damascus, Damascus into Mikdash, into the temple, which is what we're doing now. We're yearning for the temple. We're crying for the temple, for Mikdash. So his Yurtzai, his day of passing, Zilula, 
is on the fifth day, which is right in the middle of the nine days. It's like the most, we could say like in like in, intense time of the year where there's this transformation that is happening, right? In the latter years. And so there's a transformation that is happening now, despite what we are feeling, what we think is happening, what we, you know, what we feel is happening. There is a reality that is happening. And that is that Mashiach is coming. Like there's a revelation that is here in the world. You know, we are in times that are like, this is like Mashiach times, right? I was uh, sitting out uh, last night with uh, Miriam and, and we were, we have like a, we have like a large pool outside and we were, we're sitting out looking at Mayron. you know, there was like a bomb, there was like a bomb, uh, there was a siren a, a couple hours before and we're sitting out, we're like, wow, this is so cool. We get to like, we have like front row tickets, like we're seeing like, like Mashiach's time, right? That's coming forth which is interesting because that brings brings me to like the final idea that Rabbi Chaim Vital has a vision. And the vision is that he sees that this mountain of Meron, which is again where Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is buried, opens up. And he sees this huge energy of fire that is coming forth. Like he sees the mount. He, he, so Rabbi, Shim, Rabbi Chaim Vital was a very fascinating person. He had a book called The Book of Visions. Yes, he had like visions. Like he had all types of like dreams and visions. He recorded them. So one of his visions, again, is that he says he sees one day Mount Meron just opens up. And he sees like this fire coming through and he sees like this revelation of Mashiach coming forth coming towards Tzvat. <laughs> and, and he records this, right? He has this in his book. And so this revelation, right? And by the way, that mountain over there is a, an extremely strategic army base that has been a target for, you know, Lebanon. So it's a spiritual army base, a, a physical, you know, military army base, just like Tzvat is, because this war is not just a physical war. It's a spiritual war, right? It's a spiritual war of light versus darkness. It's a spiritual war of, you know, of Mashiach. And, uh, and we're all doing the work by, by, by learning, by connecting, Right by uh, by lighting a candle right tonight for uh, for the Arizal right in his honor by giving you know a little bit extra tzedakah in his honor right for his soul elevation and that soul elevation has the merit to also lift us up right on the day of of a passing of a tzaddik so we connect to that energy right and by uh, the learning which is what we're doing right now learning of inner Torah. And by learning uh, that uh, that we that we continue to do, so then we perpetuate that light and we become part of the solution, part of that gate, which um, which is uh, the gate which brings Mashiach. Um, so the book of visions was written, uh, Sally, by uh, Rabbi Chaim Vital as well. Yeah. And that was also, I guess, uh, excavated from his from his grave. So, yeah. So may his merit be a blessing to all of us, to all of you, and everything that is needed for you, each and one of you, um, in 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 physicality, in in health, in um, relationships. Um, and, and in, and in the spiritual realms, right. For everything that is, that is needed, uh, may his merit be a blessing for all of us and be a protection for all of Amisha and for all the soldiers and for, uh, everyone, um, everyone needing of, of a salvation of, of a Yeshua for whatever mm -hmm. that may be. 
Rabbi, yes, isn't yes. this this Shabbos also the vision? Chazon, that's the, uh, yes, for this exactly, Shabbos. Yes, that's right? also that's the vision. Aftara, called the Shabbos of yeah. vision. Shabbos yeah. uh, Chazon. So exactly. it coincides with everything you're discussing. Yeah, 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 yeah. This was my, the most wonderful class. I learned so much. So thank you. Thank you. I, yeah, I <laughs> I love wow. imagery and, um, you know, seeing how that correlates to where we're at. And, and to come alive. It's his, you alive. know, in, in, in Eretz Yisrael, it's, Absolutely. you know, come alive, Absolutely. everything. It's, it, it's, it's a big passion of, of mine. And I think people like to really just get, you know, understand much more about, mm -hmm. you know, history and you know, mm. you know, just, yeah, very important. If you don't know, if we don't know our past, we don't know our, our future, right? Absolutely. And, that's, that's and then we can, we can understand when we, you know, if history repeats itself, well, hopefully we learn from that. And when we learn history, some, we get, you know, can gain a greater understanding as well, God willing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and a, a big a big issue right now is that I, I think people are not aware of history are not aware of what happened in the past of how things repeat themselves and if we don't um act um you know fast and smart then it's not mm -hmm. going to turn out too well mm -hmm. um i uh pray uh, I'm not sure how to pr uh, pronounce that. Pray, Leo. Um, yes. So I'm gonna post that on uh, on our blog and on YouTube as well. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, everyone. So wishing you a a beautiful Shabbat and many blessings, and uh, and we, may we hear and see good news. Yeah. Amen. All right, everyone. Cold blessings, everyone. Thank you so much.